Hello and welcome to episode one of Paranormal Overtones, the podcast that wants to hear your stories and experiences when it comes to the paranormal and the supernatural. Today I'm going to be going over my experiences, what's happened to me over the years, and just to give you an idea of the kind of things that we'll be looking to hear from from you guys. Um, as always, you can reach out to us via email or on social media. You can find us as Paranormal Overtones on Threads, Instagram, YouTube and Facebook. And if you want to drop me an email, send it to paranormalovertones at gmail.com. Now, uh, I'm going to go and start this properly in a moment, but this is the fifth time I've tried to record this introduction. Thanks to planes, dogs barking locally, trying to find the best room in the house to record it as well. It's not been great. So um, I'm going to go and make a brew, I think, and then settle down and we can crack on together. So why don't you go and get one yourself? Uh, I will apologise in advance. This is the first podcast that I've ever done. So if the sound doesn't sound fantastic or I stutter or mumble, then apologies. But if you've not done it yourself before, the best way I can describe it is it's almost like a message in a bottle. Um, you want someone to read or hear your message, but it's not happening at the time. So it's kind of like speaking to an empty room. So uh, apologies in advance. But yeah, I'm going to go and stick the kettle on, do the same. We'll come back in just a couple of seconds and we can crack on with the first experience that I remember. Cheers, guys. <laughs> Welcome back. Uh, hopefully you've got a lovely warm drink. I know I do. It's steaming away quite nicely on the desk next to me. Uh, so for the first part of my experiences, we're going to be time traveling back to, I'd say, around 1991. Um, we're going to be going to a house that was originally constructed in the 1800s. It was called Weaver Villas when it was first built. Um, it's a house in Winsford, and it used to be the home of my nan. So when I was younger, myself, my sister, and my parents would often go and stay over at my nan's house. It wasn't a fact of we didn't get to see her. She was literally only a couple of miles away, but my nan was widowed. Uh, unfortunately, my granddad did die a couple of years before I was born. So she'd been widowed for around six years um, I'd say at this time so this house was it was massive um, it was very long it wasn't very wide but it was very very long I remember that much and it was definitely in the depths of winter now this house given the size that it was this house was always cold but it would absolutely chill you to the bones and to a four or five year old these big cavernous rooms sometimes it, it felt like there was even like mist within the room i'm not saying that was anything paranormal that could have just been my overactive imagination um but it did it chilled you to your bones um the cellar in particular i remember was it had that sort of that damp mildewy smell and you could see your breath in front of your face when you went down there. Obviously, being the age that I was, whilst my nan had that house, it wasn't somewhere that I frequented. But, yeah, the, the house was... It felt massive. To, to a kid of that age especially, but having driven past it a couple of times um, over the past sort of decade or so, I actually forgot how big the house was and, and how big the grounds were as well. I mean, the, the garden kind of sloped off... Um, if anybody knows Winsford as it was during the, the 90s, um, there was a big, I think it was a gas tower at the bottom of the town and the garden basically sloped off probably over a good 100 metres or so down towards the park where the gas tower was. Um, little wooden swinging gate through a, a little patch of trees and you were out into the, the park area near the high street. Um, but anyway, that that's where this experience took place so as i say i was probably around four or five years old um the upstairs of the house as you came to the landing if you turned right you had the master bedroom and that's obviously where my nan was immediately to the left was the first spare bedroom which is where the grandkids stayed so there was two single beds in there 
uh, I believe next to that was the bathroom and then you went down a corridor that was probably about I'd say eight to ten meters long after the bathroom and the room at the end of there that was what was my mum's bedroom when she was growing up so when we stayed over that's where my mum and dad stayed so this one time we were staying over like I say it was definitely winter because it was bloody cold um I'd woken up and gone for a week in the middle of the night it was pitch black and as I've come out of the bathroom I've heard a floorboard creak um it's taken my attention whereby I've looked down the long corridor and before I've knocked the bedroom light off uh, sorry the bathroom light off I saw that there was a figure down at the other end of the corridor stood outside the room where my mum and dad were now this figure was stood by the door frame it looked to be looking in through the door it wasn't my dad it wasn't my mum it didn't share the build of either of those it wasn't my nan and with all due respect to my sister it was too tall to be her as well um it was only really something that I kind of processed the, the next day it was like oh there, there was someone stood outside and it's like oh don't be daft don't be daft whatever and a couple of weeks later um, we were back at my nan's house and going through things now I hadn't actually obviously with him dying before I was born I hadn't actually seen my granddad as he was in his later life um, so I, I'd seen a, one picture of him and that was in his naval uniform during the second world war so we were going through these photos a couple of weeks later and i saw this picture and it's like that's the man that i saw what are you on about that that's the man from outside the room the other week no what are you on about and the <laughs> the apparition the figure the the person whatever you want to call it that was stood outside the bedroom that my mum and dad were in was actually my granddad or something made to look like him, whether that was just residual energy, whether it was an apparition, something else, I don't know. Um, but it was something that I didn't really pay much attention to at the time. But as I've got older, it's whether it was just that he was checking in, making sure that everyone was okay. I don't know. I don't fully know what to believe of it. But that was my first paranormal experience that I can still record to this day. And that was, what, 31, 32 years ago now. Still very much sticks with me in my mind. And that may have been the gateway to me being sat here recording this for you guys right now. So, yeah, that that was the uh, the first sighting that I had. And we'll move a little bit, um, only a couple of miles, and we'll have a look at the second one that I had. So, let's continue with a little bit of time travel. Um, we're going to be fast-forwarding a few years now. So we're going from 1991 in Winsford, and we're going to be going to, I'd say, around 1998, 1999. I was definitely like year six, year seven, um, and it's going to be at the house in which I grew up. So fairly normal, three-bed, semi-detached house in a rural village. It was built in, I'd say, the 60s or 70s no age to it whatsoever really um now growing up when we'd got to a certain age my sister is a few years older than me so when it was deemed that she was old enough to sort of look after the pair of us uh, mum and dad would go out and enjoy themselves as they have every right to do and there was this one night where they'd gone to i think it was a rock night so there used to be quite a big um rock and I wouldn't 
didn't so much call it metal, but it was like more rock rock than rock and roll kind of music. Um, so they'd gone over to a local club to go and enjoy that. And we'd obviously taken ourselves to bed knowing that they weren't going to be getting back until like around midnight. And I had the box room. Um, so my bed I had taken to sleeping with my head near the door my feet near the window and there was this one night where like say the parents were out and it was dark on the landing but it was I want to say it was summer because there was still like a little bit of light coming through um, not all that much where it illuminated Maybe there was like a little bit of uh, a moonlight going at, at play there, but you could kind of make out things. So you could make out the banister, you could make out the door for the bathroom on the opposite side of the landing. And uh, next to the bathroom was my sister's room. Um, so the door to her room faced the window of the landing so if you came out of her room and turned 90 degrees to the right that was the bathroom so she was kind of her door was tucked behind an alcove uh, so I didn't have direct line of sight to her door so we hadn't long gone to bed and a little bit of trick of the eye maybe was, was happening so on the landing I could make out shadows in the darkness and as alluded to before, uh, my sister isn't the most gifted when it comes to vertical uh, height. And so initial thought was, is that you on the landing? So I sort of lay there watching, seeing what was happening. And these shadows are constantly moving around. So I called out to my sister. Are you awake? Yeah. Are you in your bedroom? Yeah. Is your door open? Yeah. Can you... Yeah. The things on the... Yeah. So it wasn't just me. It wasn't a trick of the light. It wasn't just a trick of the eye. As we were both lay there in bed on our own... <laughs> we could both see these figures. Now, they were probably around three to three and a half foot tall, I would say. Uh, as I was laying in bed, they were obviously, they were taller than I was whilst I was prone, but they definitely weren't tall enough. They were nowhere near light switch height. And speaking to my sister the next day at length, she described them exactly the same, that they were probably around two to three foot tall, that they were just moving, but it wasn't it wasn't a definitive figure. It it was a weird kind of mergy, blurry shadow is the best way to describe it. And obviously being as interested as I am in the paranormal now, um it looks like the best <laughs> explanation for it, not wanting to sound fantasy, Tolkien, etc., etc., would be an imp or a nymph. Um, it's not something I'm very well versed in, but having seen what I saw that night, it's not something I've ever seen again before. So is it just the overactive imagination of preteen? Um and then the power of suggestion made my sister agree with what I was seeing. I'm not 100% sure, but I definitely know what I saw <laughs> on that night. And that was some very, very strange, blurry shadow type things that were about three foot tall on the landing of a house that I never experienced anything else in. And that's probably one of the more random things that I've experienced in my life. As I say, it's about 25 years or so ago now. And I can still remember it quite vividly. 
So what do you guys think that those blurry, shadowy, figury type things could be? Have a think on that, and we'll skip forward not by too much. We're just going to jump forward a couple of years, so I would be about 14, 15, I would say, for the next thing that we're going to discuss. So let's set the scene. It's 2002, 2003 maybe. It's a lovely summer's evening in rural Cheshire. You're surrounded by fields, trees, there's still warmth in the air. It's just going to that point just before dusk. So there's an orange glow across the night sky, well across the sky as it is. I was out uh, push biking, bicycling, cycling, whatever you want to call it, with a friend of mine from the village that I grew up in. And we were out in the countryside towards a village, or hamlet maybe even, called Whitegate. We just cycled through the grounds of Vale Royal Abbey. Anyone that knows the area will know that the building that's actually on the site now isn't the abbey. The abbey is underground, well, what remains of it anyway, um, and it's currently, I believe it's currently a, a golf club, quite an exclusive golf club. So we'd cycled through those grounds, we'd made it back down to the river, crossed the river, and we were just catching our breath. Now, again, anyone that knows the area will probably be very, very familiar, uh, especially if they're of a certain age, of the stories that surround Vale Royal Abbey. Um, now there is apparently a grave on the site of the abbey that was marked for a nun called Ida. Now depending on who you listen to, what story or what version of the story you get told, the story is that either she was murdered because she was actually having an illicit affair with one of the monks at the abbey um, there's also the story that she was tending to an ill monk at the abbey um, and then subsequently died herself. There's also the story that she was actually tending to a wounded knight um, that had nothing to do with the abbey but was living at what's now called Knight's Grange, funnily enough. Um, so the story goes, and apparently... Apparently, there is archaeological information to support this, that the nunnery that was in Winsford, uh, funnily enough, off Nunhouse Drive, as it's now called, the abbey itself, out towards Whitegate, and also Knights Grange, were all connected by underground tunnels. Now, this would have been a massive undertaking. E even by today's standards, this would be a massive undertaking. But having watched enough documentaries on what religious orders and the likes were doing during the 13th, 14th centuries and before that, it wouldn't surprise me if that's true. But anybody from around Mid-Cheshire will be able to tell you the story of Ida the Nun. Now, this isn't to say that I had an experience or me and my friend had an experience with either the nun specifically. I know there are numerous ghost stories across Winsford and the likes with regards to either the nun, even down to a few years ago, maybe more than a few. Um, there was actually an article in the local papers about the landlady of the Knights Grange pub um, frequently seeing Ida sat outside. Um, whether she was enjoying a pint or not on a lovely warm evening like this was, I'm not sure. But, as I say, me and my friend out on a push bike ride and we'd stopped to catch our breath down by the river. And as we were there, I looked back over the river to where we'd just come from. And I noticed something that didn't seem quite right um, there was an eerie stillness in the air. There was always birdsong movement in the bushes and the bracken. You were constantly surrounded by wildlife, whether that be 
badges on the move, foxes, even down to smaller things like voles, shrews, etc., etc. There is always, always, always movement in and around the riverbank at this part of Cheshire. And that all stopped. So you have the eerie stillness paired with... It's not foreboding, but it, it was a very close feeling in the air. Obviously, that's helped by the time of year that it was. And looking back over the opposite riverbank, there just appeared this mist. Now, this wasn't fog. It, it wasn't normal mist. It was low-lying. It was creeping across the floor, through the trees, through the undergrowth. And it was green. And it was weird enough at that point, but it seemed to be coming directly towards me and my friend. It was only when it got to the murky waters of the Weaver, which is always a lovely shade of brown, did it become apparent that it was actually illuminated. It wasn't just green, it was actually illuminated green because as it's gone into or over the river it was still very prominent it was still very very green and still making a beeline directly towards us needless to say two young lads not really very uh understanding of the situation uh we just got back on our bikes and rode like the clappers um it would have been the best part of i'd say a mile and a half to the top end of the village and the street lights and the safety of general population but that's what we did and again it's one of them things that's it stuck with me um, I've had a lot of paranormal supernatural experiences over the years but these that I'm highlighting to you guys today are ones that firmly stick out in my mind and that I can remember everything the sights the sounds the feeling the atmosphere that was in the air yeah the, these are the things that stick out the most and yeah that that was one unexpected experience i wouldn't say highlight or low light but it is one unexpected experience that we both had on what was our <laughs> lovely summer's evening push bike ride up until the point that that had happened so that was that and now we're going to be moving on to it's a series of experiences it was all things that happened at one location and it's a location that I spent a lot of time at because it was actually my sister's house for a good number of years and yeah it's uh, it got a little bit freaky I'm not gonna lie so yeah let's go and have a look at that so we're back in our little imaginary time machine doing a smaller jump forward this would be around I'd say 2007 2008 um, it was around the time that I was mobile had a moped had my first car so it's got to have been around that sort of time and we're moving back to Winsford as we were earlier in the episode but we're going to the other end of town now uh, my sister's first house it was one of a few buildings that were built in I think it was about 1850, 1855 somewhere around that time and it was just a standard house it was what was originally a two up two down and that had been extended out to the back. So you walked in through the front door and you were straight into the living room. There was an open archway through to the dining room, through that again, took you to the kitchen that was part of the extension, and then out of the back of the kitchen was the bathroom. So the bottom, the ground floor, had been extended out. Upstairs was, sorry, it was a three bed, um, because as you went up the stairs, there was a large room to the rear and then straight facing you was a box room and between the two was the master bedroom. So obviously with it being 
her first house, everyone was pitching in, everyone was decorating. I spent quite a lot of time there helping decorate and also do a few other bits and bobs, whether that was just cat sitting, <laughs> as I did a number of times as well. Um, I spent quite a lot of time at that property. Everything seemed fine for a time, and that's not wanting to make it sound ominous. It's true. Um, nothing seemed out of place. There was no weird energy. There was, it was a very unassuming house. No, nothing would make you suspect that anything was awry or off. So as time wore on, obviously spending the time there as I did, going over a weekend, we started to notice things. So the large room at the back of the house essentially became my room <laughs> for a time um, I spent a fair amount of time at the house so got my own room away from home yay um, and obviously the cats would walk around of a night time they would do their own thing and you could very often wake up and have one of the cats lay on your chest next to you whatever it may be the first experience that I encountered at this house was I was in bed, I was in that back bedroom and I felt pressure at the foot of the bed and obviously knowing that the cats were about I thought it was a cat until I opened my eyes. Now there was nothing there but there was pressure still at the foot of the bed right near my feet I am quite a tall guy, so obviously my feet were right at the bottom of the bed. And this pressure was still there. And in the air was just a slightly sweet smell. It's nothing like the aftershaves or the perfumes that we have come to know in this day and age. But I would say that it would very much likely be an aftershave or a perfume. I'd lean more towards the latter of a certain era. Um, and that was the first thing that I experienced in the house. Didn't really talk that much about it. It was just one of them things. Now, one of the things that we did do when I was staying over, obviously anyone that's listening to this that may be of a certain age would probably have been interested in or watched Most Haunted. So... Shout out to Yvette and Carl and everyone. But that was something that we did. Whether you did it for entertainment, whether you did it for just morbid curiosity, we watched it with genuine interest. And there was one time we were watching one of the live instalments. And we were in the living room, so obviously front of the house. And in the kitchen, the kettle turned itself on. Nobody was near it. I was on one settee, my sister and brother-in-law were on the other settee. We were the only people in the house at the time. The cats, I doubt, were able to do it, but the kettle turned on. Everyone gave out a little bit of nervous laughter, carried on. Now, that in itself would be fairly creepy, freaky, if it was an isolated incident. It wasn't. <laughs> We were, again, watching another Most Haunted Live, and the fridge door flung open. Again, we were in the living room, nobody nearby it. That is something that the cats could definitely not be blamed for. It was obviously a magnetised fridge door, fairly heavy, and it just swung open. And we're not saying it flung open, it wasn't like someone had aggressively grabbed it and swung it, it just kind of creaked open and then you heard it shut and it's it's one of them sounds, it's, it's kind of the old comparing flowing hot water to flowing cold water, you know the sound, you know the difference in sound it was definitely the fridge door closing again in isolation it would have been pretty creepy freaky but we were once more watching Most Haunted Live this time there were no bangs there were no swinging doors there was no kettle turning itself on 
but in the middle of the living room was a coffee table and on the coffee table was a bowl in the bowl was a little bit of water and some floating candles now these candles had always either been clumped together in the middle of the bowl or had been pushed out to the outside of the bowl due to vibrations the house is right on the road loads of traffic going past hgvs you name it vibrations could have affected where the candles were positioned in this bowl at any one time this episode of most naughty live they were obviously doing their call outs and i went to stand up to go for a smoke out on the back door and as i've stood up i've looked at the bowl because i was grabbing my drink and my drink was right next to it as i've looked into the bowl there are the floating candles not to the outside not clumped in the middle but formed into a perfect crucifix and they were spinning not again manically spinning not like really fast but they were slowly just whether you want to say oscillating or rotating whatever word you choose to use they were spinning in the bowl so yeah a lot of stuff happened whilst we were watching that so whether it was the call outs that they did on the show i don't know but again that's not the end of it the one memory that really truly sticks out with me from my time at that house was house sitting cat sitting and i was in the box room at the front of the house i think i'd be playing whatever the football manager simulation of the time was whether that was championship manager football manager it's irrelevant but i was sat on the computer with the door to my right all three cats were on the single bed to my left so they were all with me accounted for and I heard a noise in the dining room. Then I heard the bottom stair creak. Now, people are going to say, it's a house from the 1850s. It was settling, it's old, it's going to creak. No, give over is what I'm going to say in return. The stairs at my sister's house were very specific in how they were laid out and they made a very specific noise when you went up them. So it was two steps and then a right angle turn to the left. So it gave like a large triangular step. And then it was another 10, 11 steps to a small landing, which is how you access the back bedroom. And then it was steps up into the box room and the master bedroom. And I'm not going to cheapen it by doing sound effects or anything like that that's not what this podcast is about it's about retelling the story i heard the noise in the dining room then the footstep on the stair followed by the second stair followed by the very very unique sound of that triangular step being stood on the hairs on my neck rose I immediately felt uneasy, looked down the stairs, there was no one there, nothing there, just emptiness, blackness, devoid of light. A further two steps occurred. By this point, I am absolutely cacking myself. I'm not going to lie about that, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. If it was now, I'd probably go and investigate it, but back then, not a chance in hell. So I did what any lad from this area would do in his late teenage years. I looked squarely down the stairs and shouted, fuck off, leave me alone. At which point these steps happened again, but very quickly and in reverse, back down the stairs. So dun, 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 at that pace. And after that happened, the bedroom door got slammed shut by me. I tossed the cat off the bed, jumped under the covers and went immediately to sleep because, nah, 
I, I'm not dealing with that. That that was me done. That uh, I tapped out at that point. But a lot of stuff happened in that house, and I'm gently coercing, shall we say, my sister to come on, so she can actually go over the experiences that she had. Maybe we can look at them in a bit more depth. But again, I'd be intrigued to hear what you guys think. Uh, especially about the stairs because it definitely definitely was not the house settling it wasn't just down to the age of the house but that was what i experienced at my sister's house uh we're going to be jumping once more into the time machine again very very small step forward only a couple of years and as this podcast isn't purely about the paranormal it's majorly about the paranormal but it's not the be all and end all we're going to be having a very brief look at uh, something supernatural so yeah let's move swiftly on and travel a couple more years into the future so it's now 2008 maybe 2009 Again, it's a lovely summer's evening, and the location is a village called Davenham in Cheshire. Now, Davenham is essentially one long road with loads of little lanes, closes, etc., spurring off it. This evening, I'm going out for a meal with my best mate and his partner and my ex-wife. And we were driving down this road in Davenham and something just caught my eye in the sky so we pulled over i was driving so nobody else had a choice uh, i pulled over on the main road within davenham and started to look at this object now it was probably around five to six hundred feet in the sky it was triangular or pyramid shaped and it was just pure light it was an off-white, not quite yellow, but not white. It was kind of a happy medium between the two. And it was just there. There was no other noise except for the organic noise that you'd expect in a village. So road noise, birds tweeting away in the trees. There was no low hum, no engine noise, no nothing. So stood there looking at this thing and obviously the other people in the car got out, so we're all there discussing it between ourselves, looking at it, pointing at it. A couple more cars then pulled up and talking with them. Can you see that? Yep, bit weird. And as we were stood there watching it, discussing thoughts on what it could be, there was a low rumble in the sky to the east. And as we've looked up, Two Eurofighters came hurtling overhead, making a beeline towards this object. As they flew overhead, this object that was probably about, I'd say, two, maybe three miles away, depending on, obviously, it's all down to perspective, it's all down to how big the thing actually was. But as the two planes flew over, directly over our heads, this thing just went whoosh straight up in the air like thousands and thousands of feet per second vertical climb and it was just gone and it it must have been something why why else would Eurofighters have been scrambled it, it wasn't obviously long after the Eurofighters had been based at Coningsby with them coming from the east they've obviously not come from RAF Valley or the like because their direction would be wrong so it was actual interceptor planes being dispatched out and as soon as they got within whatever distance whether it was visual distance weapons distance whatever i'm not a pilot i'm not part of the raf can't comment but when they got within a distance of that object it just noped out of there at some speed I wouldn't even like to guess or hazard a guess at just how quick it was going. But the planes came overhead and that thing went. So in my eyes and the eyes of the people that were obviously there at the time, it was definitely a UFO. I know that UFO isn't the trendy thing to say about these things now. It's a UAP. Is it Unidentified Aerial Phenomena? 
Um, but yeah, it, it was a UFO. It was a UAP. It was something not of this world, not of our technology. And yeah, I'm just going to throw it out there. I believe um, the universe is in itself infinite. So to think that we are the only conscious beings that are out there that actually have the ability to develop technology, there's obviously other creatures because we're surrounded by animals, but to say that we're the only creatures able to actually develop technology for flight, for space travel, etc., I think that is a very, very small-minded attitude to have given the limitless confines of space and the universe there is going to be other life forms out there and maybe we are being visited maybe it's unmanned probes maybe they're just keeping an eye on us maybe it's morbid interest maybe it's something more we won't know until we need to know but that's what i saw on my way for a meal in the summer of 2008 or 2009 and it's still with me and still etched in my brain where I can still I'd love to be able to describe the colour of it a lot better than I can but unfortunately I can't so you'll just have to picture this illuminated yellowy white triangle a couple of hundred feet in the air over rural Cheshire um, but yeah so as far as supernatural experiences go, that's mine. It was a UFO sighting over Davenham where the RAF dispatched two Eurofighters to go and see what the hell it was. So, back to the paranormal. Um, we're going to be jumping forward again. Uh, I hope you're enjoying the whole time travel y, timey wiminess of this. Um, so, yeah, we're going to be jumping ahead to my first house and it's going to be around august of 2013 where we're going to pick up my next experience hello and welcome to 2013 um we've moved within Cheshire again. I know this is obviously very Cheshire-centric, but unfortunately this is where I'm born and raised. But we're now in Middlewich, which is where I bought my first house with my ex-wife. I'm not going to sugarcoat this. I'm not going to say it's anything that it's not. This was a sleep paralysis incident. So I had my son in early 2013. Uh, by this point, he not long moved into his own room so he would have been around six seven months old and he was asleep uh, myself and my ex-wife were in bed and obviously you have the baby monitors running now i said about the specific sound of the stairs at my sister's house earlier in the episode this experience is very very much about a specific unique sound so we're all in bed it's obviously night time and we have the baby monitor running next to us and i hear the baby start to coo and chuna and give out a, a few little noises that suggest that he's awake and not fully happy about it so i'm the only one that's disturbed the ex-wife is asleep and just as i'm about to raise myself out of bed I hear a very unique noise that I hadn't heard for a few years by this point. Now my other nan was disabled for the entirety of the time that I knew her so she was always in an electric wheelchair. The wheelchair that she'd had for most of my life when it was started up gave out two short beeps just like a beep beep the tempo and the pitch of it were very, very unique. It wasn't the sound that like a printer would give off when you first tap it. It wasn't it wasn't a startup sound that anything else would make. It was very much unique to that wheelchair or that brand of wheelchair. So as I've gone to raise myself out of bed to go and sort him out, 
I hear beep beep. All of a sudden, I'm not able to move. I can't get out of bed. I can't move my hands. I can't move my feet. I am fully unable to move. By the time I'm able to move, probably about 10 minutes later, I go into my son's room. He's flat out asleep and nothing is amiss. But that memory, just that beep beep coming over the baby monitor, it was as if my nan was just sort of saying, it's fine, we're all here, we're keeping an eye out. And it was as though she'd just come, checked in on him, made sure he was okay, made sure he went back to sleep. But it was very, very obvious that it was her. Um, I, I don't know what your beliefs are when it comes to the paranormal, whether you believe in ghosts, whether you're just interested from a scientific viewpoint, but I think the best way I can kind of describe my intuition towards things is that it's a conscious energy. It's not so much that there's a life after death, but we know scientifically that energy doesn't end. So what's to say that the concept of a soul isn't just the constant energy that was within our conscious selves whilst we were alive proceeding beyond death. But yeah, so like I said, not framing it in any other way, it was a full-blown sleep paralysis episode. Um, whether it was that my nan came, I'll leave that for you guys to decide, but in my mind, yeah, she was here. She came, she kept checked in, she made sure everything was cool, and she went. So that was that experience. Uh, again, obviously, this is just things that do stick out in my mind that have played on my mind. This isn't just tricks of the eye. This isn't like, oh, did I see? This is basically my highlight reel. Um, so moving on again, um, we're going to be jumping a bit more forward in time. And this is stuff that's happened in the last 18 months, two years. Um, so yeah, fair, fair old jump from like 2013. But uh, yeah, we'll have a look at what's been happening recently. So here we are. We're almost up to date, almost in the present day. And we're staying within Middlewich, not at that house, but actually at my place of work. Now, the building where I work is about 20 years old. Um, it's a very standard office building, brickwork, corrugated steel roof, and because of the area it's in, surrounded by fields. The age of the building I don't think has any bearing on what I've experienced whilst I'm there though. Um, obviously Cheshire is a very old county. The M6 runs somewhere adjacent to what was Watling Street um, and obviously the main Roman road that ran throughout the country. Um, with Cheshire being in the west of the county, there's obviously spurs off from Watling Street and Middlewich was also a Roman settlement. So th there's been there's been activity here for millennia. Um, not to say that anything again is related to oh it's it's a Roman ghost it's a it's a horde of centurions are walking beneath my feet now. Um, this the first instance was me on my own. Um, unfortunately. Because of my proximity to the office, I am the first name on the list when the alarm goes off. And it was probably around, I'd say about quarter to two in the morning. Um, I am a gamer. Fridays and Saturday nights, I do stay up late as it's the only sort of time that I can get a good run. And I hadn't long got into bed this evening. Um, I think it was a Friday night. Um... In fact, I know it was a Friday night because 
it was actually the door of the dishwasher opening at the end of its cycle that triggered the alarm going off so the actual uh, the alarm going off wasn't anything out of the ordinary wasn't anything paranormal it was just that the dishwasher door had flung open with a little bit more ferocity than the uh, the infrared scanners in the building would like and that's what triggered the alarm so i took myself off up to the office um got there and unlocked, knocked the alarm off, and as you would expect, obviously did a bit of a walk around. Nothing felt weird, nothing felt out of the ordinary, until I actually got a little bit further into the building. So you enter the building, you have the stairs to the right, the MD's office to the left. Straight facing you is a set of doors with a small corridor, and then off the back of that, you've got another smaller office and then the kitchen. As I proceeded through the first door into the corridor, as I've got close to the second door at the end of it with the office and the kitchen to the back, I've heard just noises. Like I, They weren't very intelligible to start with. But then it became quite apparent that it was actually whispering or something that sounded very much like whispering. So as I was approaching the door, I could just hear like a on the other side. Now, we do have a service stack and the service stack is located in a room off this office. But that office is where I work. I'm very well aware of what the server sounds like. I'm painfully aware of all the sounds that occur within that building. And these sounds weren't something that's normal. Especially, well, definitely within office hours, these sounds are not normal. As I've continued around the building, every door that I've approached, there has been noises from the other side. So as I've come back out of the back office, gone to the MD's office, there was whispering. As I've gone up the stairs, I've stood at the top of the stairs, slammed on all the lights and flung the door open. Nothing. The same as every other room that I've gone into. Absolutely nothing. And just darkness. When the lights aren't on, there was just darkness. No figures, no nothing, no movements. It was just this disembodied whispering that was happening throughout the building as well. So it was a little bit strange, um, as I say, given how new the building is, but that's not to say that there isn't some form of energy on the land that's below it. And given how recent it is, it isn't really... A reasoning as to what's going on um, I'd say it was built in around 2005 but the most recent thing that I've experienced whilst I've been at work was actually in daytime um, this happened over the course of a few days but I was outside um, as alluded to before I am a smoker for my sins and I happened to be outside at around quarter to four on a few days in one week. Now, the business park where we're based, there is like a low wooden fence that surrounds it. It's not even really a fence. It's a case of you can step straight over it. But the first time I saw this person, this figure, this apparition... He'd walked from the car park adjacent to our business park and didn't seem to break stride. Didn't really pay much attention to him because of how he was dressed. So he was facial. Well, he looked very much like if you've seen Shaun of the Dead, the guy that comes out in the dressing gown and gets Shaun's mum. That's facially, that is how the guy looked. With regards to how he was dressed, it screamed 90s. So we're talking brown corduroy pants and then the 
wax, like the greeny wax jackets, not talking like uh, Barbara or anything like that. I'm talking the old school wax jackets with the like fold down lapels that also had like the corduroy kind of pattern, but it was like it was burgundy in colour. Um, I hope you know what I'm on about. But that's how he was dressed. He was very much dressed in the night, like the style of the 90s. So I saw him the first day, didn't really pay much mind to it. The second time I saw him, he had again come down from the adjacent car park, not breaking stride, looked to disappear behind the cars at the other end of the car park, and then was at the corner of the building opposite where we are. As I've turned to put my smoke into the cigarette bin and then turned back, he's disappeared. Literally four seconds and he's gone from being at the edge of the building opposite to just disappearing off the face of the earth. There's no explanation as to what happened. He didn't have enough time to get into a vehicle. There wasn't a vehicle parked nearby where he was stood. He didn't have enough time to travel across the car park and he would have been in my line of sight if he had turned round to go back to the building that he was just rounding the corner of. So I think that may have been an experience with a very modern ghost. Um, yeah, like I say, he was very much dressed as a guy from the 90s. The f place where the office is would have been fields. So whether it's just, again, it's just a persistent energy. Um, maybe when alive, this guy just enjoyed walking through the fields. Maybe it was actually the farmer that owned the fields prior to. Who knows? But I saw him f three, possibly four times over the space of a couple of weeks keep meaning to go back out for a smoke at quarter to four to see if I see him again. But the pattern of where he walked was identical the couple of times that I saw him. He was wearing the same clothes. So to me, it's not just somebody who's wearing slightly outdated fashion. Uh, I would definitely be leaning into the fact of either a very very lucid hallucination or as i say it was a modern ghost it who says that ghosts have to be from edwardian georgian victorian eras why can't we have some modern ghosts and maybe that's what i saw anyway that's my experiences as I say, this podcast is all about you guys, all about your stories, your experiences, your unexplained, and I want you to reach out. So please, please get in touch, social media or email. As I say, social media, you can find us under Paranormal Overtones. Email us at paranormalovertones at gmail.com. All the information, how to get in touch, is on our social media accounts. And I want to hear from you. If you want to remain anonymous, that's fine. Just send an email. I will tell your story. If you want to actually tell your story yourself, we'll sort something out. We can jump on Zoom. We can get it sorted. Don't worry. But please, please, please tell me your stories. If it's all in one location, if it's spread out across locations, across the years, whatever it is, let's get them stories told. For now, though, this is the end of our episode. I've been Mike Lamb. This has been Paranormal Overtones. And you have hopefully been a little bit freaked out. Thanks for listening, guys.